I started my scientific career actually in Fred Sanger's laboratory. It was just at the time when DNA sequencing was really becoming uh, the field of the future. And Fred Sanger, of course, was one of the ones at the forefront of that. So I had the real pleasure of seeing it as it was being created. How do you find all the genes involved in all the diseases? And the answer is to work systematically on the genome itself, because the genome is the collection of all the genes that we have in our human inheritance. Uh, and if we develop a systematic catalog of the entire genome, and hence a catalog of all the genes, we then at least know what we're starting with. And then it's a question of applying our knowledge from that dictionary of genes, learning more about them to turn the dictionary perhaps into an encyclopedia so that we understand more about each gene as we go along, and then correlating which of those genes is involved in a particular disease. Because a particular disease involves the disruption of one gene, one function, through DNA mutations. And as a result of that disruption, of course, something goes wrong in the human body. And if you can see at one end what's gone wrong with the human body, and you can see at the other end what gene is mutated, you can then follow the path from mutation to gene to function to dysfunction to disease. And that's the root of understanding the molecular basis of disease. I think one of the key milestones in, in the, the preparation or, or the lead up to the field of, of genomics and the genome is undoubtedly technology. You could go all the way back, indeed in Cambridge, to 1953, uh, where the, the structure of the DNA double helix was first expounded in the model by Crick and Watson, supported by the data from, from Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. The Crick and Watson uh, paper described uh, the fact that digital information was stored in the DNA, passed from cell to cell and generation to generation, copied faithfully, very unlike many biological processes. So the second milestone is perhaps if we now know that information is digital, and we've got a pretty good idea it is the basis of inheritance and how things are passed on, can we decode it? And so if I move to the next breakthrough, it is the DNA sequencing, which I was very fortunate to be at least a little part of experiencing it. Uh, Fred Sanger, uh, the, the, the developer and inventor of Sanger sequencing, uh, really revolutionized our ability to decode pieces of DNA. Uh, the third milestone is, well, it's all very well decoding a piece of DNA and spending months chasing a gene. But how do you do the whole lot? How do you get the concept of the genome? Back in the early 80s, there was a big debate about whether to just sequence the genes and take advantage of the fact that DNA encodes RNA, which encodes proteins. So let's just look at the RNA because that's where the genes are, are being expressed. And let's not bother about the rest of the DNA or the rest of the genome because the genes are only encoded in 2%. The rest was widely described as junk DNA or DNA we don't know what it does, but it doesn't matter because it's not the genes. And thankfully, the decision was not taken to just shortcut the process and go for the RNA and the genes. The decision was taken to do the job thoroughly and completely and to sequence the entire genome, including the 98% that was not directly involved in the genes. That was an incredibly important uh, decision a, it made the job bigger, but more systematic. If we walked along every chromosome, we knew when we'd got to the end. Putting the whole genome together, all three billion bases, and putting it in the public domain, allowed people to sift through and search and find things they never even knew existed. That is a really important principle. DNA is not junk. That DNA is regulatory. It contains genes we haven't even found today. Uh, and it contains mutations which cause disease. And so if we'd taken the shortcut to just looking at the genes, uh, we really would have been in trouble when it comes to trying to understand the full panoply of genetics and genetics in disease. So that was a really important milestone. Once that was decided, I think it was pretty clear. There was a great appetite to share this common goal around different nations. Countries large and small got involved, and that was a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to, to illustrate how important and universal and how international the Human Genome Project was. The genome itself became a currency of international communication.
So we're at a very exciting time in terms of applying genomic information from DNA sequencing, from whole genome sequencing, from panels, from arrays, uh, possibly RNA sequencing, and seeing how this fits in the healthcare and health management uh, of disease uh, for, for an individual. Uh, today, uh, the, the, the forefront of these applications for human health uh, are rare genetic disease, which typically manifests early in life, not always, but quite often in the newborns or the, the very young, uh, where a single gene is knocked out. It can be any gene. It could be one of 4,000 genes. It could be one we haven't seen before. But this has been a remarkably uh, productive area where genome sequencing uh, has been effective at taking us from a diagnostic rate of maybe 5% up to 60%. So 60% of cases in some of these groups, we can now find a cause of the disease, and very quickly, uh, and in a way which actually costs a lot less money than the standard of care. Uh, and indeed, if the answer is found quickly, it can save money in the management of the disease that follows on. Now, it's only here today for a very small fraction of people around the world. And so already that area and the great opportunity is to say, well, what about all the other children in the world who have rare genetic diseases? So that's a massive area for the future, and, and we're doing a great deal to, to make it more accessible and usable. But this is not just Illumina's challenge. The future is that the adoption needs to become commonplace, it needs to become routine, it needs to fit into nationally funded healthcare systems, it needs to fit into privately funded healthcare systems, it needs to be translated to hundreds of other languages around the world, and to areas with different levels of investment that can actually be brought to bear per capita of the population. Those children are being born all over the world in all sorts of environments. So that's one area where the, the future really is to go from these very fortunate few uh, to a global uptake of this process and to be able to, alongside that, see how better to treat, how better to make a difference to the families and to see that translated around the world. Uh, the second area is a well-known area uh, of, pr of prenatal testing, testing the fetus to look for possible problems and to provide options, whether it's options for treatment, options to prepare for the care of the individual uh, and all decisions which a family may take, plus also telling them something about, will it happen again uh, or, or not? So these are all fundamental questions. and Some of these can be asked in the prenatal testing. Now, previously, prenatal testing has involved a very invasive procedure to take a needle, to stick it into the abdomen of the mother, to take a few cells that are very close to the fetus, but not part of the fetus, or in some cases, to take a chorionic villus sample, which actually is fetal cells uh, as part of the placenta. And these highly invasive procedures do carry some risk. As you can imagine, taking a great big needle and putting it very close to a fetus, that carries some risk. Things can go wrong. So non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT, aims to completely resolve that risk. No needle is used, or at least no needle goes anywhere near the fetus, but instead a blood sample is taken from the mother. So non-invasive or minimally invasive. A blood sample is a fairly routine thing that most people will accept, uh, and the mother is all too uh, uh, pleased indeed to avoid the invasive test, and to opt instead for the non-invasive prenatal testing to take a small blood sample from mum and from that to be able to sequence and find, potentially, in some cases, uh, some genetic abnormality which can tell a great deal, can provide a great deal of information about what's going to happen next and what may already have happened, even though the child is unborn. So that's a second area which is extremely valuable. Uh, it's extremely important. And both these two areas, the rare genetic disease of the newborn and the unborn child, of course, these are the areas where we want to make a difference most of all. This is where a whole life is possible. But let's move forward to the third pillar, which we are currently working hard on, and that's cancer. It's a little different from the genetic disease because in a cancer, there are now two genomes to look at. There is the genome you're born with and the genome that's in the cancer that's now growing because the genome that's in the cancer that's now growing has itself changed in some way. That genome is now somewhat different to what you inherited. And the differences, or some of those differences, are responsible for the uncontrolled growth of the cancer. So it's a disease of the genome. It can be decoded using DNA sequencing. Every cancer case is different and new by definition. No two cancer cases are identical. 
Uh, and so therefore, there is a need to determine the sequence of cancer in every case. And you determine the sequence of the cancer to see what's in the cancer. And you determine the sequence of the inherited genome, uh, which is different from the cancer. It's similar, but it hasn't got the changes. So typically, for example, if in a case of breast cancer or prostate cancer, the genome from the cancer has accumulated changes to cause the cancer. But you can take a sample of blood from the individual where there's no cancer and look at what the person had before they got the cancer. So you compare the prostate DNA sample to the prostate genome, to the blood genome, and you can compare the two. From the cancer, you can see what's happened to the cancer and is responsible for the cancer. In the blood, you can actually say, were there risks in there beforehand? Could we have predicted this person was more at risk of prostate cancer? So you can do an awful lot of information about a cancer. The risk of cancer in the future, from what you inherited, plus what's actually happened in the cancer that you might want to do something about. And that's where cancer is a really important area to concentrate. DNA sequencing, the ability to decode the cancer genome and to find out what's going wrong. Now, once you start doing that with lots and lots and lots of cancers, you start to see the common patterns. We know some of them very well. We know common patterns in breast cancer. We know common patterns in, uh, in, in colorectal cancer, for example, because we've done a lot of them and because people knew what the genes were for a long time. But we can do more. We can tackle every type of cancer with exactly the same test, the whole genome test, because the whole genome test has all the answers. It doesn't matter whether it's colorectal or breast, we might find things we knew about already. Or lung cancer, where we know much less. Or perhaps pancreatic cancer, which is almost incurable. Uh, and so we have the opportunity to take the same genome sequencing technology and apply it to any cancer. Uh, and look at the panoply of mutations in any cancer. And to look at the risk to the family, but also to look at what's gone wrong in the cancer. Can it be treated? Is one of the targets available? And so that's a huge area. And of course, the lifetime risk of getting cancer is 40%. 40% of people born in 1960 will get cancer at some point in their lives. So this is not a niche market. This is not a rare disease. But it's also a complicated disease because you've got the cancer genome as well as the, uh, as, as the inherited genome. Uh, so that's a very important area which we are focusing a lot of time on. And let's move on to one other way in which genomes can really help uh, the improved precision and treatment of cancer. This is through the profile of the cancer. Every cancer is different. It's a new case. Uh, it wasn't there at birth. Uh, it arises at some point after birth because of some change, and that change is only in the cancer cells, and the cancer grows, and it accumulates more changes, and eventually becomes life-threatening and potentially fatal. And people then apply various treatments. There is surgery, but there are also chemotherapeutic options, drugs which can be, be used to actually try to kill the cancer. Many of these are relatively non-specific today, so they also kill all your other growing cells, and that's what makes you feel very sick. So what we need are much more precise treatments that target the cancer and not your other living cells. And this is where we can start to make much more use of the profiling of the DNA in the cancer, because if we profile the, uh, the DNA in cancer, and if we do the whole genome, we will essentially see most or all of the changes in that cancer. And so what we start to see is not just the ones we know about, the genes that we've known for a long time, but we start to look at all the others and we start to see some changes maybe we've never seen before. So at the end of 2018, uh, we announced the completion of the 100,000th genome uh, that was part of the 100,000 Genome Project. This was a project that aimed to really take all the learnings of our technology development, uh, the potential for genomics and genome technology to help in human health and to help solve diseases. It focused on rare disease, rare genetic disease, and on cancer. And we aimed to set it in a national environment. So this was really not just one laboratory, not just one research cohort. This was a national initiative involving England uh, and uh, the, the, the neighboring uh, countries within, within the United Kingdom to actually systematically find a way and test every step of the way from taking a patient, their DNA sample, their consent, 
right through to processing and sequencing the entire genome, capturing the spirit of the original Human Genome Project. We weren't just doing the genes, we were doing the whole genome because the answer would be in there somewhere for every, any disease, whatever it is. And to doing that 100,000 times over, looking at the ethical questions, the technical questions, the logistical questions, how to handle the data, and how to interpret it to ultimately give medically relevant information back. So that's the nature of the 100,000 Genome Project, uh, and the 100,000th Genome was completed uh, at the end of 2018. There's a great deal of history that leads up to this. It was a huge milestone. Nobody had ever done 100,000 genomes before. Uh, at the peak of our production, we were sequencing 8,000 in a month, uh, and that's a pretty challenging infrastructure to set up and to keep going. And of course, this has all been done for the first time. But let me take you back to some of the history and as to how it got started, because people ask me all the time and people ask each other, how did it happen? What do I have to do to do it in my country? And the answer is probably many countries are different. Uh, but the UK story does have a number of, of, of lessons uh, that are, are pertinent. The first thing that happened, I think, is that a series of collaborations, small test pilots. Uh, Illumina was involved in a number of these collaborations. We met with doctors, with scientists. We talked about the idea of doing genomes. It all seemed very big and very difficult. But because we had the technology, we knew what we could do in the future. So we set up collaboration to say, what if? What if you could sequence a genome quickly? What if you could do it every time? What if you could do a few thousand a month? Uh, and people took a while, perhaps, to think about it, but some people latched onto it pretty quickly. And, and we started to set up collaborations where people would say, I've got just the patient for you. And we said, that's great, let's sequence it. So we uh, knocked off several milestones along the way. We did a cancer genome. We did a patient who had cancer several times in their lifetime to monitor the progress of disease. Uh, and in various ways, we explored what might be possible in single examples and then a few small groups. Uh, we collaborated with a number of centers uh, and uh, actually accumulated experience ourselves. And they also accumulated experience and familiarity with what was now possible. Their eyes were opened through collaboration. As a result of that, some of those people, many of those people who were thought leaders, who were advising governments and scientific policy in, in, in the UK, came together uh, and actually came up with the concept of seeing, is this going to be useful in healthcare? Let's ask that question. And let's specifically ask it of whole genomes. Because once again, while there are many genomic tests that use sequencing technology and use aluminal sequencing technology, whether or not to do the whole genome is something of a challenge. It's a big program. It's three billion bases every time. You've got to get them right so that you can do your diagnosis. But the big payoff, of course, is if you do a whole genome, like the Human Genome Project itself, you've got all the information there. All you have to do is find out which bit went wrong. Whereas if you only sample 10 genes, you have assumed the answer is in those 10 genes, and you've missed the other 19,990. Uh, so if you don't find the answer in there, you're starting again. So the whole genome was intended to be something of a major uh, effort for every person, but it would be certain to carry the answer to the disease, to provide the diagnosis. And if we could only get the genome done, we could then sit down and figure out how to interpret. And this was what was being done in collaborations uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, and, and then... Very importantly, the scientific advisors to the UK government felt it was time. It was time to perhaps take a leap of faith uh, and to start an initiative that really was truly of a scale that had not been tried before. There was a particular uh, feature in this in that the, the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, had in fact a child, indeed had a child, his eldest son had died of a rare genetic disease. And we were in number 10, Downing Street, uh, gathered around the, fa the, the, the famous rectangular table uh, by the fireplace in, in, the, in the conference room. And David Cameron came in and he said, um, I feel very humble. He said, I, uh, because in one sense, I know very little about what you do. I know very little about science. I got a C in chemistry O level. But he said, in another sense, I know quite a lot because I'm a parent 
who lost a child to rare genetic disease. So from a perspective of a parent, I know very much what you're talking about, and I am all ears. And that was a very exciting moment because I think that really showed how many people had come together, the scientists and the doctors with their collaborations, us, the technologists, who were working hard to make it cheaper and faster, but then the government, represented by, by the leader himself, the prime minister, who absolutely got it. And so that was a tremendous moment that signaled the intention to start something big. And David Cameron essentially blessed uh, 100 million of, of, of pounds of, of government money to actually be put aside for this. And he said one other thing. He said, I don't want it spent on research. We're doing a lot of research. I want it spent on actual medical applications. That really changed uh, the challenge. It increased the difficulty because we really had to put into practice all those little medical collaborations that we had been doing and make it systematic and to do rare disease and to do cancer as two major goals of the program. One of the very important thing that happened as a result of that announcement is that for the first time, speculation turned into reality. Because until that moment, we had no idea if anybody wanted to spend money on human genome sequencing. We had the technology, um, but interestingly, when the announcement came out at the end of 2012 that David Cameron was going to make 100 million pounds available to be spent on this, on whole genome sequencing in a medical context, that sent ripples around the world, but it also sent ripples through Illumina because Illumina suddenly had a clear sign that this could be a real future market. And as a result, Illumina actually fast-tracked its development of the high end of our technology to actually develop sequences that could sequence whole human genomes. Whereas until that point, we didn't know. So already the partnership between the UK government and Illumina was forming. Each was affecting the other without even knowing it. But as a result, we all started converging on the same path towards the idea of sequencing whole human genomes in a medical context. And Illumina started beavering away on its development. We continued to work on our collaborations. We looked at discussing things with the government in negotiations. Uh, and so that process started to accelerate and converge on what was to become the 100,000 Genomes Project. One other important milestone in that the particular group in Cambridge, an old friend of mine, 20 years we'd been working together, also was very captured by the imagination of the idea uh, and, uh, uh, and actually we started a 10,000 genome project a year before the 100,000 genome project started. That was a smaller, simpler relationship. It just involved Cambridge University Laboratory. Uh, Willem Auerhand was the principal investigator uh, and a prominent uh, uh, clinical geneticist as well, Lucy Raymond, uh, and others. And we got together in Cambridge to start the first 10,000 genomes. And that gave us practice of a large project, uh, practice in negotiations and contracts and how to really establish such a partnership. And this became, in fact, the pilot for the 100,000 genomes. So in fact, these 10,000 genomes are now wrapped up into the 100,000. So the main contract only involved the remaining 90,000 genomes. But that was a very important milestone started in 2013 where we all practiced ahead of time. And then in 2014, we were back in number 10 Downing Street again, uh, this time signing the agreement to do the remaining 90,000 genomes, uh, to do it at a, a very affordable price that really made it relevant to human healthcare and to an accuracy, uh, a completeness that was also relevant in healthcare and really would support diagnosis. So that was 2014. The starting gun was really uh, fired August the 1st, 2014. Uh, Jay Flatley, the then CEO of Illuminar, came over to England. Genomics England had now been formed as a, as a company to, to make the project happen in England. And so the CEO of uh, Genomics England and the CEO of Illuminar, so Jay Flatley and John Chisholm, the CEO of Genomics England, uh, shook hands uh, in number 10 in the signing of the contract, which was quite thick, but actually it was only about two inches thick, perhaps the document, so it could have been much more detailed. And it was a tremendous contract. We had spent weeks working day and half the night to actually flesh out the contract because this wasn't just a legal negotiation. This was a complete project plan that was being written down uh, to say how would we do it. 
So we wouldn't just argue the wording of a legal paragraph. We would be asking questions, well, how are we going to transfer the data? How are we going to make it secure? How are we going to keep it safe? And so all these questions are being answered in real time during the negotiation process. So it was a very productive eight weeks or so uh, during the early part of 2014 that led to the signing of the contract and the starting of the 100,000 genomes project itself. So what we formed was a partnership, which was initially a partnership between Illumina and Genomics England. Genomics England acting on behalf of the government and the National Health Service. Uh, and so our primary partnership was directly with Genomics England. And we, we started to work out how to execute the contents of the contract to do 100,000 genomes. Essentially, the partnership was a, a complementary relationship, but also a, a synergistic one. So the complementary part was that we, Illumina, took on the responsibility of setting up the technology to work at a scale that nobody had done before, to sequence 100,000 genomes to provide the data, align it, reassemble the genome to its uh, essentially uh, decoded version, and to provide that to Genomics England. And Genomics England, for its part, would work at both ends of this process. They would engage the patients and the doctors and collect the samples. They would do the consent uh, and look at all the ethical approval required for the program. Uh, they would do public engagement of both the medical professionals and scientific professionals and the general public and the patients. And then at the other end, they would take the genomes from Illumina and they would interpret them and send reports back to the doctors uh, for return to the patients to see to what extent and how it had an impact on the understanding of the disease in each individual patient. So that was the partnership, a complementary par partnership. Genomic England at the start, Illumina in the middle, genomic thing at the end, and bounded at either end by the patients and the doctors themselves. And as Sally Davis, the chief uh, medical officer of the UK said, when the contract was signed, it starts with the patient and ends with the patient, and let's thank them. And that remained a very important uh, and, and focused perspective, both for Illumina and for Genomics England, that this is about the patient. This is not about technology. This is not actually about discovery and research. This is about the patient. And let's all focus our efforts on that. So that was the real beginning of the concept of the 100,000 Genomes Project. In addition to the complementary nature of the work we did, we also partnered in a much more close sense in that there were roadblocks. There were roadblocks that neither of us knew how to solve. And so we worked together to collaborate on those roadblocks. Particular examples being cancer samples, tend to be taken from a tumor or a biopsy, and they tend to be embedded in paraffin and fixed in a way which is wonderful for looking at the tissue, but it's a hopeless way to treat DNA, so you can't sequence it. So we had to come up with a solution to this apparent conundrum that every cancer patient had its sample fixed and embedded, um, but you couldn't sequence the genome from it. And we eventually did work through a number of options uh, to get rid of the fixative, to provide alternative fixatives, and various technical developments. And we carefully evaluated the quality of the genome. How much did this affect the quality of the genome? Was it still useful for medical diagnosis? Uh, and the answer in some cases was no. And in other cases, we actually came up with protocols that worked. And Genomics England took on the process of rolling these out to the centers around the nation. Uh, that's not something Illumina did. That's something Genomics England did. But we worked together to remove the roadblocks and we worked together to implement them as part of the 100,000 Genomes program. Towards the end of the project, which accelerated hugely in, in 2017 to 2018, uh, we went from 1,000 genomes a month to 8,000 genomes a month just in, in, in the space of a few months. Illumina were working very hard to ensure that scale up without any loss of, of quality, uh, without any loss of samples. Genomics England were working to go on recruiting patients and uh, talking to doctors about who should be in the pipeline, continuing to engage the public. And that culminated at the, at the end of the year, uh, end of 2018, uh, and into early 2019, where after the sequencing of the 100,000th genome, there was the continued hard task of interpreting and understanding the information and returning the, the, the reports back to the patients. And now I think uh, 75,000 reports have gone back. 
Uh, that is most of the results have now gone back to the patients and we're continuing to see what the impact is on, on healthcare. The impact is clearly good. Uh, there are many results both in and outside the 100,000 Genomes Project to illustrate what the significance of the results are, how many people benefit from it, and the results have been tremendous. Within the 100,000 Genomes Project, uh, at the first pass, it looks like a quarter of the people who suffer a rare genetic disease now have a diagnosis, an explanation, and that's after just the first pass. And one of the beauties of the human genome, having all the information present, is that actually when new discoveries are made which explain new diseases, we find new genes involved, actually you can go back to the person's genome and just have a look. You don't have to do another test, you just have to have another look. And actually, in many studies, I think outside the Genomics England project, we've seen that in a year, perhaps 25% more diagnoses can be made than the previous year because of the nature of research running alongside uh, and actually continuing to add information to the human genome itself, and that information becomes relevant to explaining disease. So that's rare genetic disease, tremendous start at 25%. Uh, continuing to improve uh, as the rest of the community understands genetic disease. Cancer, a second uh, good result, I think, of, of a subset that had been studied. Some 7,000 were picked out to have a look at what the impact of the genome was on, on the cancer. Um, and uh, I think some 50% of those cases, Genomics England, or the team, found a mutation or information that potentially might alter the management of the cancer patient. And that was tremendous. People said cancer was much harder. It is much harder, but it still yields some very informative results. And finally, to go back to what was one of the first promises of the Human Genome Project itself, voiced by Francis Collins some 10 years earlier, he said he thought one of the first potential benefits of the human genome would be to better understand how to prescribe drugs, how to tailor treatment to the individual particularly the field of pharmacogenetics, where the, the pharmacies or pharmaceuticals develop the drugs, um, but which drug suits which patient? Not everybody is the same. Some people have adverse events to drugs they are prescribed. Some people have no effect from the drugs that are prescribed. And the trial and error process of prescribing a drug to, to, to fit a particular symptom uh, is, is a laborious and costly one and causes suffering to the patients. Interestingly, from the Genomics England, again, a subset of some 6,000 patients were looked at uh, for the possibility that mutations in their DNA or variants in their DNA might tell us something about which drugs to prescribe and which drugs not to prescribe. 72% of the cases they looked at actually had valuable information about how to tailor the treatment and prescription of drugs better to suit the individual. And this is a real milestone because this is, this is the illustration of the concept of tailored medicine or precision medicine, how to be more precise about treatment of a patient based on genomic information. And this is therefore also genomic medicine. And so we begin to see the whole process of the previous 20 years actually coming full circle. If you sequence a person's genome, it tells you something about the person. And as a result, you can treat that person with what they really need as opposed to treating the symptoms, trial and error, uh, doing well in some places and not in others. And this, the promise that was there in the Human Genome Project itself, the promise explicitly stated of the 100,000 Genome Project is now coming true. And that's very soon after the, the 100,000th genome has, has been developed. So that has clearly uh, provided evidence. It's not a complete, uh, completed clinical study that there's still a great deal of, of gaps to fill and questions to answer. There's much more to be done. How do we get the 75% of the rare genetic diseases that have not been diagnosed? What about the other 50% of the cancers? What about new drugs that actually might be more effective for some of these? There's a whole area that will develop over the years, founded on the Human Genome Project itself and founded on the 100,000 Genome Project. How that will proceed, interestingly, is where the 100,000 Genome Project takes another leaf from the Human Genome Project itself. The 100,000 genomes have all been banked in one data center with a view to making the information accessible to researchers who want to look not just at a patient, 
but they want to look at all of them at once or a subset of them. Let's say somebody wants to look at all the leukemia patients. They can go to the 100,000. They can select out the leukemia patients among them and look at their genomes. And so this is the second goal of the project. If the first goal was to benefit the patient for the 100,000 genome project, the second goal was to provide a new foundation for research to better understand our genome and better understand how to treat it. Um, the third goal, of course, of uh, the 100,000 Genome Project uh, was to build the infrastructure for future implementation in routine healthcare for the NHS, for the National Health Service itself. The fourth goal of the project uh, was a more national one in the sense that clearly this is a new field and it should be fostering uh, economic growth, new businesses, new research agendas, uh, and ultimately new treatments for patients. There is more that could be done to make it more accessible to populations, and by extension to make sequencing or arrays accessible to other studies such as agriculture, uh, uh, such as microbiology, uh, and these are areas where almost countless numbers of samples might need to be sequenced. And so the next challenge is simply managing the amount of data, uh, and already we've done a huge amount, not, not just us, but, but the world has worked hard on managing data, compressing data. The computer industry, of course, has increased its capacity to handle data. And now we start to look at new techniques for examining data quickly to find things that we cannot, we don't even know we're looking for. Artificial intelligence, deep learning. These techniques are now being applied to DNA sequence to find things that are really important medically uh, or biologically, but we, couldn't, we didn't know how to look for them before. So we have to let the data almost speak for itself. We'll generate lots of data from 10,000 or 100,000 people or more, but then we'll let the actual artificial intelligence look for the patterns and query it in different ways. And if you input various variables into an AI-based learning process, uh, you can put another set of variables in another day and you can see what comes out. And so you start to let the data speak for itself with, with these methods of AI and, and learning, which will actually hopefully uh, significantly improve our ability to interpret the data we've now learned how to generate. So that's an important problem. How do we extract more information out of it? How do we look at it quickly, economically? Uh, and we're still the same humans. We can't suddenly understand 100 times more data. We can have 100 times more data, but we have to compress it back down to the same amount that we can see and understand. The difference is our decisions are now informed by 100 times more data, which is incredibly powerful. But the same clarity of decisions and applications of the information need to come out of all that data that we've now generated to tackle every problem. So data mining, is another important area. Data storage is a very important area. There has been a question, of course, as to whether it's more expensive to store a DNA sequence than to do it again. And as the, that, that, that means that two different technologies are both at play in studying the challenges of data storage. One is the computer industry learning how to store it more economically. The other is the sequencing technology saying, yeah, it's cheaper to sequence it again, get a fresh result. Uh, and so both models might apply separately or together in solving the challenges of, of, of data management. So one of the other challenges that we face with genome data and the use of, of sequencing and genotyping uh, in, in, in a very wide context is in human populations. So we come back much closer to home because the human genome or the genome of an individual human is a complete description of its genetic makeup. Now, for a long time, we have uh, struggled or had to cope with the implications of such information. Uh, it has questioned the fundamental privacy between a doctor and a patient, because the information about the patient that's genetic immediately reads out onto all relatives, known or unknown, uh, living with the family or estranged from the family. And so already genetic information about an individual transcends boundaries that raise questions and in some cases cause discomfort with individuals. And this is the whole area of the ethical use of sequence information and the practice of communicating such information. Doctors have grappled with this for years and successfully uh, in the structure of the family with a rare genetic disease, hemophilia, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis. 
the process of genetic counseling has been uh, a profession within this area for a long time. People have learned what questions you ask, how you communicate the information, what do the people need to know and what is not useful to know and what is important not to communicate. And translating it from the family that might have hemophilia and muscular dystrophy, so you have a diagnosis, but then somebody's got a sister and the information might be of relevance to the sister, but in a different context from the person who has the disease, because the sister might be a carrier of a disease and future children might have the disease. And that's the fundamental basis within the structure of a family, a nuclear family, uh, or a slightly broader uh, set of family relatives. Genetic information is sensitive and can be difficult to challenge. Fast forward now to the situation we're in today, where a complete genetic code is being generated in 24 hours for a very affordable uh, price, uh, and suddenly there's an awful lot of information to play with. And this raises two questions. The first question actually I'll deal with is, you may find things you weren't looking for, and the consent forms for genome sequencing have to make that clear. You may find out things or we may find out things that you're not expecting to, you're not asking to know about. Maybe you want to know about your risk of cardiovascular disease, but we go and find a, a high risk variant that might give rise to cancer. You didn't ask the question about cancer. Now, do we tell you about your risk of cancer or you didn't ask us so we won't tell you? It's very hard to know what the right answer is. And there are committees, uh, particularly the ACMG, the American College of Medical Genetics, has spent some time and some years defining what is important to pass on, even if the question was not asked. And these in particular boil down to, can anything be done? And is the health of the person threatened? So there are some codes already established for how to handle genomic information. It's just the genome is much bigger, there's much more information, and there's much more of the fear of the unknown potentially from a genome. It's not like the 10 genes we all knew about, which one have you got, which ones do we communicate? Suddenly it's about the whole genome. It's about something the doctors don't know about. And so that uncertainty can lead to fear. And so that raises a whole ethical debate about what's the benefit versus what's the risk, who controls the information, because the doctor has a duty to provide information that may affect the health of the individual or may allow for treatment earlier than if they didn't know. But the person has a right not to know risks for the future. Uh, and the ethics of not wanting to know are quite important. But that's not the doctor, that's the individual. Uh, so there are interesting questions that are unresolved and indeed to some extent unresolvable. They will be different for different people. And that's where genetic counseling is so important. Genetic counseling doesn't give you an answer. ACMG will give you an answer for which ones we need legally to report because we can do something about them and save a life. Uh, but genetic counseling is more about what do you need to know? What do you want to know? What matters to you in your family situation? So it's the individualization of how we handle the genetic information, which is a huge challenge. And to be very simple about it, and everyone will acknowledge this, there just aren't enough genetic counselors to go around. So we have uh, raised a whole area where there is not enough expertise, there's not enough training. It's like bioinformatics, but genetic counseling is another area where there just needs to be more expertise or more tools to accelerate the process so that it can become accessible to the much wider uh, population of people who are going to confront these challenges. Um, another element to this is education because we can talk about needing a genetic counselor for every person's genome, that's an awful lot of genetic counselors. But of course, what we can also do is educate the people whose genomes are being sequenced to better understand and grasp what it is they need to know, what it is they need to think about, so they can take some share of the decision-making or the policy-making uh, and, and quite simply get more comfortable with the idea. I think that society has many times over confronted something totally new and unexpected and feared what might, be, might, might happen, but then actually it's become fairly straightforward and commonplace. And I think genomic information has already started to do that. I think uh, 10 years ago, people would be very hesitant to sequence their genome or to have their genome sequenced. I was once at a meeting. I said, any of you had your genome sequenced? No hands went up. How many of you would have your genome sequenced? 
A couple of hands went up. If you had cancer, would you have your genome sequenced? Every hand shot up. So people's perceptions actually take that decision based on what they think is important. And that's the same principle that can be applied in more difficult or perhaps controversial areas than cancer. And one of the most telling recent events, I went to one of the celebrations of the 100,000 Genome Project, and there were a number of patients who had been part of the program, that is to say families with small children who had suffered. And what was really interesting was some of them had wonderful success stories. My child's uncontrollable epileptic fit stopped because the genome was sequenced. We found a dietary supplement that made them better, and we can cope. It's not a complete cure, but we can cope. Life changed for that family. Interestingly, that meeting also had a number of patients who had not received a diagnosis, and they were still struggling with the fear of the, un of the unknown of what was wrong with their child and, and who's, who, who, why was it there? What could they do about it? But interestingly, those people too expressed a huge support for the project and saw the benefit to other people. So the process of educating the population about the benefits versus the fears, from experience, from experience of people in the same situation as them, even if they have a different outcome from them, they begin to understand the project. And over the course of time, through education, education of the professionals, but in particular through dissemination to the, to the general population, to the general public. And the, the outreach and the public engagement is a very important part of the Genomics England project, and it's a very important part of every national and local project. That begins to settle the fears. People start to understand it because they have tangible examples uh, of the benefits. And so suddenly the, the, the whole landscape of ethics is changing because the people are changing. So it's not to belittle, the challenges that people face. There will always be ethical dilemmas, uh, but I think there's much more than just the, the challenges that are put in front of the door of the genetic counselors. There are many, many ways in which we will evolve, we will adapt, we will get used to the idea of this information about us being useful, and then we will reassess the risks uh, of that information being, being generated, and, and gradually, I'm sure, perhaps quite quickly, uh, we will ultimately see um, a, a general acceptance of the value of genome sequence information and genotyping information to the individual, the benefit uh, exceeding the risks uh, as, as we go forward. Illumina was founded in 1998, which was very early in the process of the Human Genome Project. And so it was much less clear what the business model was for genomics or a genetic technology than it is now. And so to some extent, there was a very uh, innovative th thinking process, thought process going on within Illumina uh, to recognize the value of genetic information, uh, to look at a technology that would really extract nuggets of information, sample bits of the genome, single bases from the genome, in, and, and to choose those bases that were really informative and important and put them together on a single microscope slide or an array uh, so that we could then type individuals or determine in every individual who had which bases at each of the positions. And this was the concept of genotyping which is born in Illumina. So Illumina's strengths has been in bringing to bear its understanding of chemistry, biochemistry, physics, mathematics, computational biology, to produce something that can generate the data. Illumina will continue to play to those strengths because there's a great deal more sequencing to be done. Assays can be better, cheaper, easier to use, better to, easier to, to understand, and we can play a big role in that. But the emphasis or the challenges is now moving from, we don't even have a technology to do this. Well, now we do, and it'll get better. But there are also other areas, and Illumina will continue to play a role in some of these other areas. We're looking at how better to store DNA, how better to interpret the information for some diseases. But we can't possibly hope to do all that. So a much greater emphasis for Illumina is partnership. It is partnership, it is collaboration, because the whole world needs to solve this problem. And this goes back to the principle of the Human Genome Project. A very important decision was taken in 1996 to make the human genome sequence 
freely available and in the public domain. And that's the same concept. If you make it available to everybody, everybody will start using it and its value will increase uh, and its contribution to the future will increase. The same thing is true here in that if the problem to be solved is to go from the DNA of a person or a cell to an actionable answer uh, that actually can, can save the person's life or make their life better, that process is far bigger than Illumina. So Illumina can play its role best by partnering with others and making its technology and its know-how available to actually really help the other experts do their bit so that together we put together comprehensive solutions that are truly the best in the world. Not the best Illumina can make, but the best the world can make. Genetic information is really important. We don't fully realize the implications yet, but a technology that can actually extract that information cheaply, quickly, makes it all accessible to people worldwide. Uh, in contrast to a major international consortium, which cost $3 billion to do one genome, did it very well, but you can't do that for everybody and you can't introduce it into genetics or medicine. So Selexa, uh, in a spin out from Cambridge, uh, at the same time, uh, and uh, my involvement in both of these was I was uh, uh, first customer of Illumina to actually buy a system from Illumina. Uh, I was also one of the advisors that suggested Selexa should be founded uh, to actually try to tackle the sequencing problem. So it's interesting seeing the three components to coming together. Selexa uh, on the UK side, following the tr Cambridge tradition of decoding DNA. Illumina uh, here in San Diego, uh, actually developing the genotyping method to fast track the process of decoding. And the Human Genome Project itself, which was coming along to underpin both these technologies. Uh, and the combination of the human genome sequence being available, the technology to extract the information from individuals quickly, and the third piece of the puzzle, which are the populations or cohorts or patients, those are the three components that were required to fully realize the promise of the human genome. And so Illumina was right in there from, from, from 1998 uh, with its initial genotyping platform. And of course, if we fast forward then to 2007, Illumina acquired Selexa, recognizing how far the field had moved uh, and, and, and seeing that the future lay not just in genotyping a few points across along each uh, segment of DNA, but in getting the entire genetic information replicated, copied, sequenced for every person. And so that's when the switch from genotyping only to genotyping plus DNA sequencing became a fundamental tenet of Illumina and Illumina acquired Selexa. Um, it was a very uh, positive acquisition. Uh, it was a really uh, uh, synergistic process. Uh, and since then, of course, both the Selexa technology was brought over. Um, it had a California center as well, uh, but it was brought over into the Illumina uh, um, uh, nest. Uh, and at the same time, Illumina also began to invest in the Cambridge site. And as a result, Illumina became much more international. Illumina started to be able to, to have access to all the UK and European uh, intellectual know-how uh, and the academic environment. And as a result, so Illumina became very global. So it became a leading global company with multiple technologies to decode the DNA of people and then see what to use it for in a population setting and in a medical setting. So that was really how Illumina got going. Uh, Illumina and Selexa have had in common a very innovative uh, and disruptive uh, process uh, to actually evolve the technology as it goes. Uh, Illumina moves very fast, it always has done. One of its values is to move fast and embrace change, which reflects on the pain of moving fast as well as the benefits of moving fast. Uh, but it's a very important value to have and to recognize that it's, when you're pioneering technology, it, it can be a rough ride, it can be a very fast ride, but it can also disrupt society and make a huge difference to, to the welfare of people. Uh, and this is captured now in, in our mission statement, uh, to improve human health by unlocking the power of the genome. It sums up the story that we've just been talking about. Um, so that's where Illumina and Selexa have been together. Now, if we look at the progress that's been made, just to single out the sequencing for a moment, because I'm more familiar with that field. Um, but back in 2000, 
We were there in number 10 Downing Street announcing the completion of the first draft of a human genome. It had cost nearly $3 billion. It had taken seven years and uh, a number of uh, institutes in multiple countries. Then in 2008, we used the technology just after the acquisition to sequence our first human genome uh, using the Selexa chemistry and the Illuminar's engineering technology. Uh, and we sequenced that genome in a few weeks. Uh, and we estimated it was about a quarter of a million dollars to do it. Um, today, we've probably improved the efficiency of the process by close to another million fold. Uh, much of that is in speed and also in cost reduction. As a result of which today, uh, a genome is done for less than $1,000. It's done to a very high level of accuracy, and it can be done in 24 hours. Uh, so that gives you an illustration of just how disruptive and how innovative the technology has been. Putting together the Illuminar and Selexa legacy, if you will, and looking at, at the tremendous disruptive innovation which both companies, but now of course Illuminar, which has acquired them both. So centralized around Illuminar is this disruptive innovation. The continuous investment in how to make things better, faster, cheaper, and really for the benefit of human health. <laughs>